Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another NeuroTools webinar. Uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Sharon Crook joining us today. Uh, Dr. Crook currently holds a joint appointment between the School of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences and the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University, where she uses computational approaches to study the dynamics of neuron and neuronal networks and the mechanisms underlying plasticity due to trauma, learning, or disease. Dr. Crook also contributes to the development of NeuroML, which we'll be hearing more about today. NeuroML is an international effort to create a common standard for describing computational models for neuroscience research. And we're very excited to have her joining us today, and we're very excited that you are all joining us today. Uh, without further ado, ado, excuse me, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Crook and get this webinar started. Thank you so much. Thank you guys uh, very much for inviting me to be a part of this series. I, um, I have watched a lot of the webinars on tools and, um, you know, it's always really informative and great to hear more about them. So I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about NeuroML today and um, I want to tell you a little bit about why uh, we need NeuroML, um, but I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, NeuroML and various tools, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on motivation, um, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of reproducibility and rigor. So if I focus on that, then, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about reproducibility in um, the entire neuroscience community and beyond, and of course, computational approaches are um, not immune to the problems of reproducibility. Um, and my colleague, Angus Silver, has come up with a very nice way of um, sort of concisely describing some of the problems around reproducibility in computational science. And so one issue is, of course, that if we want to reproduce computational models, they need to be accessible. We need to be able to get them. We need to be able to um, rerun them, and, um, and hopefully build on them as well. Um, and so part of this idea of rigor in the computational sciences is all, it also depends on accessibility. So we, um, if we uh, want to be sure that um, other people are, are, are testing our models and um, making sure they do what, they, what we say they're going to do, then they need to be accessible. Um, ideally, though, um, we wouldn't just have access to code for models. We'd be able to run them on, um, on different types of simulation platforms, using different types of tools, visualize results with many different types of tools, and that's the issue of portability. And so um, in computational sciences, um, things will be more efficient and more rigorous, and we'll be able to um, you know, develop models faster and reuse them better if we have good portability. And then there's this last issue of transparency. And so Transparency is really about um, this idea that, um, you know, sharing code is one thing, but being able to understand every aspect of the model, the metadata associated with the model, what do the different variables represent, what are the units, um, um, transparency about um, how the model was developed, what kinds of constraints were used for the model, what kinds, uh, if it's a data-driven model, then what data were used to constrain the model. These are all important aspects of reproducibility and rigor. And so when I talk about NeuroML and a lot of these tools today, I just want you to understand that these are the type of issues that these tools um, were developed to address. Okay, so next, what is NeuroML? So I'm going to start with a very simple example to just give you the main idea. Um, so let's suppose we have a very simple general model, like this one on the left, for a, um, a passive um, um, current in a membrane. And um, we want to expose this variable V. Um, and then we have a couple of parameters, G and E, where this G is, represents conductance, of this passive channel, and E is the reversal potential. So this is just a standard you know, thing that we use in neuroscience models all the time if they're conductance-based. And then we can talk about you know, this general model, we can talk about a specific instance of this model. And for a specific 
instance or instantiation of the model, we need to know what the values are for these two parameters, G and E. So, um, you know, in, in lots of models that are out there, we'll have equations that include a term like this, you know, this term in, in the model. But in NeuroML, we can make this very specific. In NeuroML, what we need is um, we, we have this definition of a passive channel, and then to, um, to uh, you know, share that model in a, in a NeuroML document, all we need is a statement like this. So NeuroML is a markup language. There are tags that describe the data that are important for, um, for that document, for that model. And so we have this name, passive channel, and we can share the values of G and E. Um, and so that's sort of the high level descriptive of this component of a model that you can give in NeuroML. Um, what's important is in NeuroML 2, uh, 2.0, NeuroML is built on top of um, uh, LEMS. And so LEMS is basically um, um, also a markup language underpinning um, NeuroML. Um, but it's much more um, detailed, and it gives the mathematics behind the model, all right? So it um, gives information about what, um, what the equations would be, what the dimensions of different um, elements are, and, you know, things like that. And so NeuroML is the high-level description. LIMS gives the details and the math. And the important thing is LIMS is also machine readable. So you can use LIMS um, to set up equations and things like that that are, that are underneath the NeuroML. So what kinds of things can you describe? What kinds of models can you describe with NeuroML? Well, I think a lot of people know that you can describe um, these types of uh, um, morphologically detailed, biophysically based models um, with NeuroML. Um, but you, uh, NeuroML also includes a lot of um, abstract types of um, single compartment cell models like integrate and fire, um, adaptive integrate and fire, and things like that. So many types of uh, conductance-based models, whether they're single compartment or morphologically realistic, and also more abstract models, um, extra spiking neuron models, um, as well as networks of those cells and some different types of synapses um, connecting those cells can be described with NeuroML. I wanna give one more example that's a little bit more um, complex than the passive um, current example. And so here, here's a well-known model, adaptive exponential integrate and fire model. And so in this box here, you see the equations that are needed to describe the model. There are quite a few parameters. Uh, one of the interesting things about this model is that well, with different parameter sets, of course, um, different instantiations of the model, you can get different kinds of behavior like are shown here in this figure that was taken from the Brett and Gerstner paper. Uh, so in NeuroML, um, what we need is something like this, this adaptive um, exponential integrate and fire model is a component in NeuroML. So this is, uh, this is the name associated with that. And then all you need is a list of parameters in order to describe a particular instantiation of a model. So two examples are given here. And then again, associated with this, underneath this, um, this model um, component here that you can describe with NeuroML2 is this LIMS that describes the equations underneath that and you know, what you do with them um, uh, in, uh, in simulating them. Okay, so I'm not going to talk a lot about LIMS. I mean, I'll mention it a few times, but if you want to know no, more details about LIMS, um, here is the um, publication uh, from 2014 that gives the details about LIMS and, um, and how it's used, um, you know, sort of underneath these high-level NeuroML um, components. All right, I want to mention one more thing before I go on, and, and I just want to remind everybody of the sort of the power of having a model description language um, that is um, in XML, that's XML. And so um, the idea here is that, um, as I said earlier, you have tags and um, we can define all kinds of tags, tags, sorry, to 
add additional information about models. So for instance, we can have, you know, a tag that gives metadata about the publication or the authors of the model or something like that. Um, we can have notes that say something about what the model does. So there are a lot of extra things that we can put in there um, along with uh, the parts that are important for doing a simulation that are then always going to be associated with the model. Um, because it's in XML, it's also really easy to map this description onto other formats. So for instance, we can map onto um, simulation formats um, like, uh, you know, neuron code, genesis code, something like that. I'll say more about that later. We can also map to um, something like HTML and have a very nice human readable format for all the information associated with the model. So we can you know, display parameters and their units and, um, and definitions of parameters and things like that. So that's one of the nice aspects of having this very um, complete model description um, that goes beyond just a list of equations. We have all this additional semantic information that goes with the model that's important to maintain over time. And then we have access to it, you know, uh, within other tools. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about some tools that have been developed within our group for working directly with NeuroML documents. So these kinds of tools are, are um, more relevant probably for um, um, software developers, but they're important. So, you know, I'll say a little bit about them. Um, so if you go to the NeuroML website, and this is actually at... Um, neuromel.org get neuromel under development there's this table that um, kind of points you to places where you can get all of this information so importantly there are schemas that define all the um, the pieces of neuromel you know what the tags are that you can use and how they describe um, uh, different parts of the model um, data there's documentation that you can um, link to here some nice examples um, and then also publications. But there are also these additional tools, these libraries that um, contain routines, you know, um, code and things that are very helpful for dealing with neuromal models. So for example, um, we have Java implementations and Python implementations, uh, this, this um, thing called JLIMS and PyLIMS um, basically are for dealing with the LIMS files. Um, most importantly, you know, you can think of LIMS as, so you, you have a model described in NeuroML, um, and then, you know, LIMS gives the um, mathematics underneath that. And so we can directly execute, we can directly simulate a model um, through JLIMS and PyLIMS. So it's kind of a, rep a, 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 um, a nice way of, of being able to run a model without having to worry about generating any kind of um, code that you use on a simulator or anything like that. Um, then we also have these uh, APIs for dealing with uh, NeuroML files. And then if you want to kind of be able to do everything, uh, this is wrapped up into um, JNeuroML. And then uh, if you're more interested in dealing with Python instead of Java, we have this PyNeuroML that that basically um, wraps JNeuroML. It you know it can do everything that you can do in JNeuroML with a with a just a Python interface. Um, let's see. So I I think I'll leave this you know at that and just tell you that these things are here. Um, if you have more questions about this, some of it is covered in publications, some of it is not. Um, I'm happy to you know answer questions offline or or point people in the right direction. Um, but I guess the point is, if you are a developer, there's no need for you to you know, develop these things on your own all over again. You can go here and use these libraries to do all kinds of things with NeuroML files. Okay, and so this is a sort of a schematic um, going over some of what you can, you know, this sort of main ideas that I was pointing out there. So you have these NeuroML core definitions that I was pointing out through examples earlier. You can use them to define um, or to describe abstract network models or detailed um, conductance-based models and networks of those models. Those can be described with this. 
But if you have things beyond that, so for, for example, um, as, an, as an example, if you wanted to describe maybe a really complicated type of synapse where you have um, some sort of signal cascade um, that, is, that is more like a sort of biochemical network, the kind of thing that you would typically describe using the systems biology markup language, SBML, then um, you can import that into LIMS. Um, we have import mo mo modules to import SBML into LIMS, or you can define custom component types in LIMS that go beyond what is currently part of the NeuroML core definitions. So LIMS makes it easy to extend NeuroML in some ways to, um, to things that aren't currently described in NeuroML. And then with LIMS, you can directly simulate those more complicated models using JLIMS or PyLIMS. Um, you can also um, export to different simulator languages, um, you know, simulator codes, um, as long as the simulator, of course, will handle, um, you know, all the components of the model, you know, it, it can handle um, all that functionality. Okay, so here's a quick example because a lot of people don't know about this, you know, business of being able to import SBML files. So um, here's an example. This is uh, this was done by Poor Gleason, my um, collaborator, who's in Angus Silver's lab at University College London. So here's an original SBML model imported uh, uh, using JNRML imported into uh, LAMS. Um, here it's simulated with JNeuroML, which, uh, if you remember, includes JLIMS, um, so you can directly execute models um, with that. And then uh, also exported to Brian, to MATLAB, to Neuron Code, and run in those simulators. So this is an example of how you can how you can do that, and of course you can combine SBML with um, more typical uh, neuromel models, um, if you like. Okay, so those are tools, you know, developed by our group, libraries, and things that are very helpful for um, interacting with uh, neuromel. But of course, there are many other tools out there that provide some sort of support for dealing with with neuromel models. Um, and I'm not going to have time to talk about very many of them, but I will talk about a few. Um, so if you go to our website, um, neuromel.org, and look under tool support, um, you'll find um, a lot more information about tools and what kind of support provided for different, by different tools. Um, and, uh, you know, here's just a, this, this is just a snapshot of a few of those tools. Um, so... Sorry, I'm, my mouse that I'm using to do the pointing keeps forwarding my slides. I don't know why. <laughs> I must be touching something not quite right. But anyway, so um, there is some support for NeuroML in, in many simulators, some somewhat directly. That, so they will, for instance, Neuron will import um, some aspects of NeuroML, um, but then we also have tools to um, as, as I described, to create simulator code that can be used directly in Neuron. There are a lot of other examples here. There are a lot of visualization tools that will um, visualize um, um, uh, network um, um, anatomy, sort of how cells are, um, are set up in space and how they're connected and things like that, or morphologies. Um, there are databases that um, provide outputs in, uh, in uh, NeuroML and things of that nature. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of these more specifically. So one I want to talk about is um, Neuromorpho, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, this is a really nice repository of morphologies um, that comes out of um, Giorgio Ascoli's lab. And, um, you know, it's, it's been around for a while and it's now become, you know, such a great um, uh, resource for, for so many of us. Um, and I just wanted to point out that if you 
go to a model, I mean, if you go to an entry at Neuromorpho and you look at one of these morphologies, and if you then uh, click on this 3D neuron viewer, viewer um, you'll see something like this. You may have to mess with it a little bit because this is Java and you have to get past the security um, that your computer wants to impose on you. But once you get this, um, this um, viewer going and you can see the morphology within the viewer, there are a few other things you can do within the viewer. For example, you can save this morphology file in uh, a couple of different additional formats beyond the ones that are that are provided directly at Neuromorpho. Um, so for instance, you can save it in the format that's usually used by Neuron by Genesis, and you can also save it in uh, Neuromel format. Um, and then I wanted to mention this, this other tool, which is quite new that some of you may not know about, which is fantastic. This comes out of Bill Litton's NeuroSim lab, and the um, developer is Salvador Dura Bernal, um, very talented, developer and I'm really excited about this tool. I can't wait to use it myself. We're starting to use it in the lab. Um, so as is pointed out here, NetPine is a Python package um, that is meant to make it helpful to um, develop more complicated uh, network models um, to be run using the neuron simulator. And so, you know, there are other ways out there to create network models for Neuron. Um, the thing that's so exciting about NetPine is that um, it also um, will define the, um, uh, the parallelization that should be used in the simulation to make the running large-scale models more efficient. And so as an example, if you go to the NetPine um, documentation here, you'll see this figure um, and of course, the reason I'm mentioning NetPine is that NetPine supports uh, NeuroML. So you can see here that uh, NetPine will import NeuroML cell and network models. It also provides export for NeuroML. And in between, um, you can have this high level specification of uh, you know what kinds of cells and networks you want to have, what kind of stimuli you want to have, what kind of connectivity. NetPine will then do the instantiation, create the, um, the instantiation by determining where cells will be located in space, what um, all the specific connections are. It will um, balance the distribution uh, for the parallel simulations. And then you can um, simulate in Neuron and bring the results back in for analysis and saving. Okay, so those are just a few of the many tools that you can that you know that are exciting that are out there that you can use to um, to run neuromel models and and do different things with them. Um, but of course, um, if we're if we want to focus on reproducibility and reuse of models, um, you know, I've, I've been talking a little bit about portability and, uh, and transparency, but I haven't talked very much about accessibility. And so we need to be able to access existing models. And so you might have questions about, well, where can I get models that are in NeuroML format? Um, you know, especially if you're wanting to develop new models and you want to be able to evaluate a bunch of existing models, decide which ones um, satisfy the conditions that you have for what you want to do, and then maybe build on those models. How can you do that with, with um, NeuroML? And so one thing that you can do is you can go to um, the NeuroML website, and if you click on models and, you know, kind of go through a little ways, you'll get to this, uh, this database, NeuromLDB. Or you can go directly to NeuromLDB with this URL. And so NeuromLDB is, um, it's a still a little bit of a work in progress, but there are a lot of models here. Um, you know, there are a few things that uh, we're still working on, and we're working on getting a lot more models into the database. But there are, uh, there's plenty of stuff here to serve as a, as a starting point for um, doing some modeling. So you can search for NeuromL models in, um, 
in this, uh, in this search interface, um, there's keyword search and there's also an ontology based search that uses uh, Neurolex um, relationships. And so, for instance, if you search for, you know, a model, uh, something like Purkinje cell, cerebellum, because you're looking for Purkinje cell models, um, you'll, any model that, um, you know, basically has Purkinje cell as a keyword is going to come up. And so what you see on the left is a Purkinje cell model and the channels associated with that model. But then it will also do things like um, uh, use this uh, Neurolex ontology to say, well, this is, a, this is a cell in the cerebellum, so maybe the user is interested in, you know, other models of other kinds of cells in the cerebellum. And so then on the right, you'll see ontology-based recommendations. So you'll see, you know, other cells coming up that may be part of the cerebellum or part of, um, of networks that include Purkinje cells. All right, so then if you click on uh, one, of these, one of these models, so for instance, if I click on this Golgi cell model on the right, um, you'll see uh, something like this in the interface. And so it gives you information about a particular model. It shows the Neurolex IDs associated with that model. Um, it, if you click on this publication, it'll take you to PubMed and give you the publication that, uh, um, where this model was um, presented and described. Um, and then, of course, it gives the NeuroML files for the model. So you can see here there's, a, there's a, this Goldie cell morphology, and then there are some channels that are associated with the model. Um, you can then click on one of these channels to go to a different page explicitly for that channel. Um, you can go to, uh, so down here at the bottom, you see a network. If you click on the network, it'll go to a network that includes this model um, cell. Um, you can download, uh, you know, a zip file with all the files associated with this model, you know, things of this nature. Um, and then I wanted to mention, of course, um, there are links to other places where this model appears. So this is model DB, for example. If I click on this, it'll take me to model DB where I can look at um, the entry for this model at model DB. So probably the original code for the model, uh, you know, maybe a neuron or or something like that, or in or Genesis. Um, and then if I click here, it will take me to this model in Open Source Brain, which I'll say more about in a little while. Okay, so on the next slide, I show the entry at model DB for this same model. So this one is in Genesis, and you can, uh, you know, get the Genesis files for the model. But also now, if you go to model db and you were to search and you were to find this model um, if the model is in neuromal db um, down here at the bottom in model db you'll find the associated entries in neuromal db and so then you can you know the nice thing is you can now click uh, back and forth between these different resources and find whatever it is that you're particularly interested in so maybe you want the original code and the neuromel or something like that, you know, you can, you can get both. Um, and so I, I put this here because I wanted to mention that, um, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, published models that have been converted into neuromel that are, that are in the neuromel database. Um, uh, and I wanted to mention explicitly that, um, you know, the cell paper that came out a while back for um, the Blue Brain Project, um, that's now part of the Human Brain Project, um, they released a large number of uh, model files for the cells associated with the network in that paper. And so all of those cells have been um, converted to NeuroML and they are available in um, this database. And, and uh, if you look at this interface here, you'll see, you know, this entry for a neocortical basket cell, for example, but there are actually three of these cells in the database. And so if you click on this download model files, I believe it, it gives you um, all the files for all three of them. So they have, you know, they have three different morphologies with the same channels. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about open source brain. 
which of course um, I am a uh, I don't know, minor contributor to Open Source Brain and a, and a user, um, but Open Source Brain comes out of my collaborator um, out of Angus Silver's lab at UCL and um, Porig Gleason, who is a, you know, the major contributor to Neuromel, works on Open Source Brain as well as many other people in Angus's lab. Um, but uh, so Open Source Brain is a fantastic project and it has a lot of great tools that are meant to be used with normal models. So it's important for me to um, tell you about it and hopefully many of you will go check it out and decide to use it. It's, um, it's really a fantastic resource. So if you go to the front page for Open Source Brain, you'll see something like this. And if you haven't been there before and you, or you don't use Open Source Brain, I um, highly recommend um, exploring one of these models here on this entry page because when you go to these pages, click on these projects and look at these models. Um, there are some really nice tutorials that will, um, you know, kind of walk you through how you can use some of the tools here at Open Source Brain. And they're very powerful, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's well worth um, going through these tutorials. Um, and so I'll say just a little bit more about, you know, what Open Source Brain is and, and what it's um, meant to do, and then maybe show you a few screenshots of these tutorials. Um, or of some of the projects. So Open Source Brain is meant to be a collaborative workspace. So modeling the brain together. Um, so it's a very nice resource for um, being able to share all kinds of information about models. It's built on top of GitHub. Mo uh, many of you will be familiar with GitHub, which is a you know, social um, coding site where um, you can use a version control system to um, to interact with code and um, it provides a nice way for people to um, you know, fork projects, work on them, merge them back in and things like that. And so this is a way to work, to work in parallel on different models and then merge um, different um, workflows you know, back into, um, uh, into a model or, or just work in parallel and have you know, different versions of models and be able to compare them and, and talk about them. And so because it's built on GitHub, you have this nice version control system that keeps track of models and how they're changed. And um, it's very helpful when you're, for instance, changing parameters or making slight changes to models and you want to be able to return to um, uh, where you were before, but it also helps with transparency and um, and accessibility of models. Um, so Open Source Brain is built around these different projects uh, for, for different models. It provides wikis and, um, and all kinds of other nice tools um, that are helpful in um, um, you know, communicating about the models and the model development. So here is a screenshot of what you see if you go into this uh, hippocampal CA1 pyramidal cell project that you can access from that front page. And so uh, one of the nice things about Open Source Brain is that um, there's this beautiful visualization of cells. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of functionality already built in here in terms of being able to visualize cells, um, being able to interact with a model, um, you know, looking at distributions of channels and things like that, um, being able to um, simulate models, you can run them, you can then play them back, um, you know, playback results and things like that. So this is a single cell model and, you know, and meant to show a few of the things that you can do at, at Open Source Brain with a single cell model. Um, and then uh, they have a lot of other tools there for, interacting with um, network models. And so um, there are many, many projects at Open Source Brain. Uh, most of these projects, almost all of these projects have NeuroML um, files um, for model descriptions available with the models. Um, these um, tools here are, um, you know, take advantage of the fact that you're using NeuroML and you have, um, the, you know, all kinds of rich information about the models themselves. So, as I said, I um, recommend that you go and check out Open Source Brain. Another um, great thing that you can do at um, 
open source brain is you can um, uh, interact with the neuroscience gateway. Um, so I was telling you earlier about NetPine. Um, and so one of the things that you can do with NetPine when you, when you um, use NetPine to um, describe how you want to run models in parallel in Neuron is you can submit those models to um, Neuroscience Gateway and then you can download your results and you can analyze them and visualize them at Open Source Brain. So Open Source Brain is meant to also provide a resource where you can um, you know, develop large scale models in, in NeuroML and you can simulate them you know, offline, get your results back and, 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 and do this um, you know, interesting visualization at Open Source Brain. Okay, so I want to talk a, a little bit about um, um, something else that we're doing that's related to NeuroML. That, um, this is, um, what I'm going to show you now is uh, work coming out of my group, but it is, um, it is mainly the work of my collaborator, Rick Gerken, um, who works with me here at ASU. And um, I think it's, um, it's also really important, and this um, work, uh, trying to be able to automatically validate models, um, is highly facilitated by the fact that we can, that the models are described in NeuroML, and um, it makes it much easier to access everything we need um, in order to be able to do this validation. So let me tell you something about this validation. So. The idea here is based on the idea of unit testing in, in software development. So, you know, if you're not a, develop, a software developer, then let me tell you, you know, what the idea here is. When you're developing software, you try to define these um, tests called unit tests, which are kind of the, the smallest things you can come up with that are a test of whether the software is doing what you want it to do. And, you know, typically you'll, run the tests on your software, and then when you add some functionality to the software, you run the tests again and you make sure that, you know, you haven't broken something that, that, the, um, that the software could do before. And so this idea is highly relevant if we're talking about models. So we can, you know, think about, um, for, for example, one model. Here I have um, a graph showing a whole bunch of models and how they perform. Um, uh, on multiple tests, but even if you only have one model, then you can think about, well, what is it that I want my model to do? You know, as, if, it's, if it's a biophysically based model, then it might be as simple as, well, I want it to um, be able to um, um, reproduce, um, or, or when I simulate, I want to be able to reproduce um, these, uh, you know, quantitative values that were that we would normally obtain uh, in, you know, some sort of experimental paradigm, right? So for data-driven models, in other words, we want our model to match our data, but this makes you make that very precise. So in what way does the model need to match the data? What are the specific tests? In other words, what are the specific simulation protocols where I create data with my model, I create simulated data that I would compare to experimental data. So, so what, are those, what are those tests? So this leads to transparency. So I could say something about, you know, these are the precise tests that I use to constrain my model, um, but it also is helpful in reproducibility and model evaluation. So if we, if we wanna reproduce work of others, um, we want to be able to say, uh, you know, something about, well, if I evaluate, uh, you know, a whole bunch of models and, um, and I have some ideas about um, what I think those models should do because they're models for a particular cell type, you know, how well do these models um, meet these goals? All right, so that's the idea. And this is the implementation. So um, psi, psi unit, uh, which you can get to here. Here's, here's the, um, the website for, uh, for neuron unit at SciDash. But so SciDash is, uh, is just a, is a website, a way, a portal for, for accessing SciUnit 
and neuron unit and, uh, and similar um, unit testing paradigms. So psi unit is meant to be domain um, uh, agnostic. So it's not specific to any particular domain. It's sort of the infrastructure for doing this type of testing. And neuron unit um, then further refines that to um, a domain for neuroscience models. Um, and so if you go to this website, you'll find information about neuron unit um, and links to um, uh, GitHub repositories where um, you know, all this infrastructure um, resides and where you can contribute to um, to further development of neuron unit all right so neuron unit is this infrastructure for um, developing tests saving those tests in repositories so different people can use the same tests um, for um, for um, automatically testing models and displaying results of um, of test suites, for example. All right, so let me give you um, an example of, um, you know, sort of this idea of, of testing of models. So in this example, eight neuron models. Um, so uh, these, are, these are downloaded from ModelDB. These are models of mitral cells. And they're all um, deterministic. They're all spiking. Uh, neuron models. Um, some of them are single compartment, some are multi-compartment. So obviously the models were developed to do different things, right? Um, in this case, just to keep things really simple, um, as a demonstration, we tested, um, we, we ran simulation protocols that um, reveal the membrane and action potential properties. So things that are very, very simple about these um, mitral cell models. Okay, so, um, you know, here's an example. You, you run a simulation and you can calculate some of these things. All right, so we need experimental data to compare to. And um, one great place for obtaining experimental data is at neuroelectro.org. So for this example, went to, um, 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 the page for olfactory bulb mitral cells at neuroelectro.org, and you can find things like input resistance, resting membrane potential. Um, one of the cool things about Neuroelectro is that they're they're mining the literature, they're they're getting data points from multiple publications. So, um, for any one of these boxes here, um, these blue dots. If you click on a blue dot, like click on this blue dot you'll get a window like this that says, you know, here's the value and, um, you know, here's the neuron type um, that we're discussing here, that we're seeing the information for here. Um, and here is the publication where that, that, that value um, came from, right? So it, um, you know, collates information from multiple papers and presents it. Um, and, you, you know, you can get this information through an API or you can look at it yourself at the website. Um, so it's a, it's a really great resource for finding um, information, published information about um, electrophysio uh, electrophysiological properties of um, particular neuron types. Okay, so eight models. We're really just looking at some simple things like membrane properties and action potential properties. Um, not more complicated, um, you know, cell behaviors. But we're getting values for these properties from Neuroelectro, and we want to then, um, you know, um, consider this where each one of these properties, there's a test that runs the simulation, compares the simulated values to um, values from Neuroelectro. And this is a figure that is then um, uh, summarizing the results from this. So in this case, um, the test provided a z-score. Um, for each model that is listed here, the blue dots are the six properties, um, oh, sorry, the results from, this, from the six different tests where each test is a different property. All right, so for instance, for this model, there are six dots here that, um, that provide the z-scores for that particular test. 
Um, the models are, um, are ranked here by um, their average across the six tests. And, um, you know, this is just an example. Of course, many of these models might not have been originally developed to um, recapitulate those particular properties, right? So, you know, the point here, though, is that you define the tests that are important to you, the things that you want to evaluate, and then you can be transparent about what those tests were, right? So, it, either in developing your own model or evaluating the models of others, you know, you can be very clear about what the tests were. Those tests are available in repositories. You can link to them. You can say, you know, this is the particular test that I ran and, and you know, and, the, and these are the results. Um, you know, we also have, uh, Neuron Unit has ways of showing test results in tables, um, using color coding, you know, all kinds of different ways of, of visualizing test results. All right, so a few of the key features. Uh, neuron unit um, can generate tests using data from Neuroelectro, data that's available at the Allen Brain Institute, some of their websites, um, um, data from the Blue Brain Project, data from your own lab. So, you know, there, there is already infrastructure for doing that, for taking data from those places. It's fully normal uh, compliant, so, um, it works um, very well and very quickly if the models that you want to run are described in NeuroML, um, but it also supports Neuron. So right now we have support for Neuron and for the JNeuroML um, uh, reference simulator that I was talking to you about earlier where we can just um, uh, simulate models directly from NeuroML um, using the libraries. Um, there's also support for NeuroConstruct, which I haven't really talked about today, but NeuroConstruct has very nice um, support for NeuroML. It was developed by Porig, uh, Gleason, so of, of course um, uh, it's a great way of um, creating a model and then being able to um, generate the NeuroML for that model. Um, Neuron Unit also supports parallel test execution. So we've been running tests on Neuroscience Gateway where um, we can run, uh, you know, a lot of tests at once uh, or test a lot of models at once. And um, we're also uh, working on um, routines for doing optimization where the neuron unit tests provide the evaluation of the model, of the model's fitness. All right. So as you can imagine, if you can evaluate a model with a bunch of tests, then, of course, uh, um, once you have that evaluation, that can feed into different kinds of optimization routines. So um, this is work that we're doing now. There's some initial um, um, genetic algorithm optimization routines um, that are available. Um, neuroscience Gateway in integration, there are, there are a lot of um, examples that are available um, using Docker containers and, and things like that. So if you're interested in validation or you're interested in using some of this to um, constrain models that you're creating in your own lab, then, uh, you know, get in touch and, and Rick or I would be happy to, um, to answer any questions that you have. Um, uh, there are quite a few groups already using Neuron Unit, which is great. It provides, you know, platforms and good feedback for, um, for rapidly um, um, improving routines and adding functionality. You know, what is the what, what are what is the functionality that people are you know mostly interested in in um, having? So, for instance, we're collaborating with the Human Brain Project, and they're using Neuron Unit for some of their uh, model development. Okay, so. I am almost done here. I just wanted to summarize that what I've tried to do is tell you a little bit about what NeuroML is, um, that it's a description language for a lot of different types of models for cells and networks and uh, synapses, um, uh, things of that nature uh, that we use in neuroscience. Um, it is in a, 
in and of itself, it's just a description for a model, but the important thing about NeuroML is its role in um, this ecosystem of tools um, that can be used for model sharing that make it possible to um, simulate automatically a large number of models at once, um, that make it easier to do things like validation, that make it easier to, re to reuse models for efficient model development, and things of that nature. Um, I described a couple of tools, but there are over 40 simulators, databases, visualization tools, etc., cetera, um, that are described at our website under NeuroML um, tool support. Um, so I urge you to go and look at, you know, some of the things that are out there that you may not have ever heard about um, that provide some support for NeuroML and make it easier for you to do modeling. Um, and then importantly, we have um, other resources that are associated with NeuroML, like the database and open source brain um, that serve, you know, sort of different functions uh, let you either get models really quickly and then go somewhere else and, and do things with them or at open source brain you have all these tools at your fingertips that you can use to um, to simulate models and visualize them and develop them um, in a very nice collaborative open source uh, environment and so what are the things that we're doing now what, what are the directions well this uh, model validation I think is really exciting and um, um, I think it's going to be um, really helpful in, um, in, you know, making it possible for people to um, quickly evaluate a lot of published models, see what, you know, see what they do, see how they um, recapitulate experimental data, um, and, uh, and then be able to select them to extend them and reuse them in models, you know, that they're interested in building. Um, and then, of course, um, NeuroML is, um, is, you know, it's an ongoing process of um, adding functionality to the schema uh, for things that people are really interested in. So um, if you um, decide to use NeuroML and, you know, some, some functionality that you need is not there, please let us know. And we're happy to discuss that and um, and try to get it into the into the you know um, into the existing schema. So I want to take a minute, <laughs> uh, Dr. Crook, uh, yeah. just so yeah. that I could put it into the chat. Uh, do you have a contact email address that you yes. would like me to list in the chat yes. box? Yes, yes, I should I should have put it there. Oh no um, problem. So, so Sharon dot Crook at asu.edu. Very easy. Got it. asu.edu. Okay. Yes. And I'm very happy to, you know, answer all kinds of questions offline or later on down the road. If you're watching this on YouTube, you know, get in touch. I'm happy to help you find whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, so uh, so yeah. I, have a, um, I have a kind of a broadish question. Um, so this is Anita, and um, I just wanted to, to sort of highlight a couple of things that um, I think maybe people don't necessarily appreciate from the outside um, and, and kind of, um, you know, just, just uh, again, highlight as opposed to really ask a lot of uh, questions. So one of the things that you have really done extraordinarily well, um, and so I should have really planned this because we, <laughs> you know, we have had um, at the NS, um, Neuroscience Gateway seminar already or the webinar in this series. Um, and, you know, we're going to have some other ones coming up. But the real question um, is always, well, there are so many tools, how do they fit together? And I, I think one of the really nice things about um, your particular talk has been um, that you've kind of brought together this environment. And I guess my only question from that perspective is, what do you think is still missing? I mean, where are the places where people have had to uh, download, do some manual steps, and then, um, or are getting stuck? Do you, do you have a good feeling for that? Do you have a sense of that? You know, what else do we need to integrate into this, this ecosystem? Yeah. So. That actually reminds me that I meant to make a slide. <laughs> I meant to make a slide where I put on it, what is the catch, right? Because I'm telling you about all these great things you can do with NeuroML, 
Um, and I'll, I also should say that one of the things that's really exciting to me is how much, you know, all these tools have come together in the last few years. So, you know, we've been working on NeuroML forever, but what is happening is that as other people were working on other things, the fact that they were willing to, you know, use NeuroML, import NeuroML, export NeuroML, you know, you know what I'm getting at. It's, it's, it's been this long process of a lot of people working on a lot of different things in parallel and exactly. they're now just coming together and really working. Exactly. Together. It's that interoperation part. Right. It's right. working together very nicely. But okay. But there is this, what is the catch thing? And I would say that right now the bottleneck um, with NeuroML really is um, this import and export issue, right? So it'd be really nice if um, you could just, you know, create your neuron file, you create your neuron model and push a button and export NeuroML, right? That's what, that's what you would really like. Um, and so this is something we've been working on for a really long time, but we're just not quite there yet. Now there are tools like NeuroConstruct and um, NetPine, which I discussed today, that will export NeuroML. And so I think, you know, we're getting to the point where um, it's much easier to get your model into NeuroML. But if you've already created your model, you know, like a while back, and you want to get your model into NeuroML, we have tools to help you do that. Um, for instance, we have some nice libraries for taking neuron models and, and um, exporting NeuroML, but it doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't work perfectly, right? There's always some little thing you have to fix. So you export your NeuroML model, you have it sitting there, but now you have to test it. You need to then um, use your NeuroML description for your model to generate simulator code and then run it and compare it to what you had before to be sure that everything that you had in your original model, you know, is now in your NeuroML model. And, you know, sometimes there's some little stuff that has to be done by hand. We're getting closer and closer <laughs> to being able to do that. The problem is that, you know, the neuron format is really, it's code, you know, it's like writing a program. And so there are a lot of edge cases, there are a lot of different ways of doing things. And until all of those, you know, until, until we have a way of accounting for all of those, you know, it could be that in your model you did something a little bit differently and, you know, our, our, um, our code for, for writing out the NeuroML doesn't work quite right. So I would say right now that is, um, you know, probably the hardest part of using NeuroML. But I, I really think in the future, you know, the goal is a user, a modeler, wouldn't ever even need to know what NeuroML is or think about it, right? It's... Right now, it's something that, you know, all the developers and the, you know, software savvy people um, can use. Um, but for instance, if you go to Open Source Brain and you're creating models there, then ideally you wouldn't have to worry about the NeuroML too much. Right. So that's when standards become really useful once they disappear from, exactly. your, from your workflow. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so that's, um, that's great. And um, I just wanted to put in a couple of plugs. So, uh, you know, all, uh, most of these tools that I've checked today, they all have RIDs. Um, so any developers um, online here that would like to um, take control over their resources in SciCrunch, uh, the RIDs are um, in the chat for NetPy, NeuroUnit, and um, of course NeuroML um, should have an RID, you know, front and center. Um, just uh, yeah. to it actually, has one. I should put it here. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, you should. Yes, you <laughs> yeah. should. So I'm going to make you do that. Um, at okay. some point. I will add it to my slides before awesome. I put it on. Awesome. Because that's how you want to cite it. So the other part of, you know, of all of this is how do we give proper credit to these kind of tools? Um, so, uh, you know, that's always been my, uh, my big part of all of this. So, um, you know, I'm just putting the plugs in there and um, you can also take control over the, um, uh, you know, the, the entry and hopefully when somebody cites your tool by RID, you'll get a little note um, from us and hey, you know, you've been cited. Yeah. Um, so that's that true. That's true for all of these tools. And again, um, it's wonderful to see how they're uh, uh, cooperating now with each other and and working and playing nicely. Um, so I don't see any other um, other uh, uh, questions on the chat. 
Um, but um, we are also out of time. So I'm gonna okay. um, I'm gonna have to thank you. Oh wait, is there another something going on? Oh, I just provided a little bit of information um, for where we'll have this recorded webinar. Uh, in a few hours. We'll have it on the uh, upcoming webinars tab of our newinfo.org website. And uh, we'll also be posting it to Twitter. Um, I also just wanted to thank Dr. Crook for taking the time to make this informative webinar. Uh, but if a, a, uh, Dr. Bandrowski, if there's anything else you'd like to add, uh, please feel free. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, no, that's fine. I think uh, I just wanted to, to say thank you. And, uh, you know, we are out of time, but um, we really appreciate um, all of you for listening. And we appreciate you, um, uh, your, uh, you know, taking the time and, and getting all of this, uh, this information pulled together for everyone. So um, thanks a lot. And we look forward to many more webinars. And I think next week are uh, the Human Connectome Project. Yes, correct. With Dr. Jennifer Alam. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, Dr. Kirk.